is not so much about or she's not being aware of the potential problem, but that some of the things that we think to understand about that phenomenon might be wrong. I'm Stephen Fairbanks, a writer and teacher from St. Louis, Missouri, and you're listening to the Vance Crow Podcast. Welcome back to the podcast. I'm glad you're here. Today, we interview Thomas Steiger. Thomas is from Austria, and he is now a professor at Northwestern University, and he does something pretty interesting. He is trying to discover where are the gaps in science. Sometimes scientists can get focused on just a few genes in the Human Genome Project or just a few ideas when looking at aging, and he wanted to discover what are the blind alleys we're going down? What are the reasons that we keep studying just a small percentage of the entire huge ocean that we could be looking at? Now, Thomas is a mild-mannered guy and uh, very humble, but this is an interesting conversation because he is trying to push and prod and figure out what can he do to stimulate one of the next great scientific revolutions? I really enjoyed this conversation, and I'm glad to be here to uh, be facilitating these Up the Graph conversations. We are doing this, and the rest of our time we spend doing legacy interviews here in our private recording studio in St. Louis, Missouri. If you have a loved one that is great at telling stories, or somebody that you've always wanted to get to open up to tell you about their childhood, about where they came from, about why they made the career choices that they did, or how the experience of parenting and being married for many years was like, then consider going to LegacyInterviews.com. There you can sign up to have me do a private interview with your loved one for right here in our studios where we'll discover these things, put them together confidentially, and send them to you so you can have it recorded as a time capsule for as long as you hold that video. We are excited to do this. This has been wonderful work. And if you're interested, go to LegacyInterviews.com. All right, now without further ado, let's go to my interview with Thomas Steiger. Thomas Steiger, welcome to the podcast. Hey, Vance, thank you for having me as a guest. So you study all different sorts of things about the genes and which ones are being used, but one of the things that caught my eye is that you were working in the realm of trying to stop or slow aging. Um, that seems like a Tower of Babel. So how does one even begin to say, let's try and stop human aging? Yes, yeah, so there are many things that people have already tried. And I think there are like over 500 different theories that scientists already had like decades ago on what causes aging and why we age. So like there are many great ideas out there. Um, one thing that I'm trying to spot is opportunities which have not been explored. Although there's a lot of research about aging, see, where are the things that have not been investigated? There could there be more that we need to understand about the aging. So when you say not um, well understood, I mean, like people know, hey, if I exercise, if I keep my flexibility, uh, you know, I just had Laszlo Barabasi on. He said, hey, if you eat well, you know, you'll slow down aging. But you're talking about something far deeper than that, yeah? Uh, possibly, yes. Or at least always the hope. So basically, we know some things that slow aging. Basically, it's we shouldn't smoke too much. We should kind of not eat too much. Uh, and we should do some exercise. And that really helps us actually to live longer and live a more healthy life. Um, but still, all of us age. And there seems to be some things that we cannot overcome just by those factors. So the dream would be to find new ways that maybe add to the things that we already know about aging so that we can prolong life and that we can make people live healthier for a longer time. What's your intuition? Where will you find these things that people haven't found before? Um, my intuition would be that this relates to things that are more difficult to spot. So scientists often gravitate. So science is difficult. So scientists often find themselves kind of approaching the least difficult problems first. Um, and it could be that there are some things that are a little bit more difficult to tackle, but have been missed by past scientists. And the general approach that I'm taking with my research is um, to compare uh, data that has been collected in a very unbiased way 
against the scientific literature and asking where are the discrepancies. And so what does that mean? Like you're, you're like combing through papers and trying to spot errors? <laughs> so that's a side project that I'm actually doing with a collaborator at the University of Sydney, uh, where we also try to spot errors. And that's part of it. But uh, it's even broader. So basically uh, looking at things, not necessarily that are wrong in the literature, but things that are not represented in the literature. So we're basically, if one looks at a lot of data, many, many, many measurements about aging, like how things that change as we get older, as animals get older, um, things, in, seeing what are the things that change, but actually have never really been studied by any scientists in greater detail in any publication. It's kind of where these gaps of knowledge. So as I was looking at your stuff, you talk a lot about using machine learning to be able to discover these like gaps in the knowledge. And when I hear that term machine learning, um, you know, I can feel my eyes starting to roll back in my head because so many people have used that term for so many things that it feels like it's like, um, like back when people were like, we're going to, we're going to do cloud computing. Oh, we're going to do AI, but it doesn't really mean anything. When you use the term machine learning, what are you talking about and how does it work? Basically, I try to make computer this copy the way that all of us scientists would cumulatively approach science. So that basically the computers can say, oh, th these things are likely to be studied. And when we kind of ha have this understanding of how scientists approach science, which basically is traceable through this machine learning, we can actually also ask, what are the things that maybe a computer or then an extension the scientists would not be investigating? What are the things outside of the machine learning? What are the things that we can predict? And what are the things that seem interesting, but are outside of what we would predict scientists to study? And what have you found? So we have found that basically no matter which disease we are looking at, roughly half of the elements that seem to be most um, promising in these large unbiased data sets have actually never been investigated by any scientists, which is a surprisingly large number. So picture, for instance, uh, Alzheimer's disease. Alzheimer's disease basically concerns many, many people and affects the lives of many families. And there's a lot of effort trying to mitigate Alzheimer's and promote research into Alzheimer's. And one of the nice things that the United States National Institutes of Health is doing is to release a list of genes, uh, which they suspect to be a very rewarding research target. So basically genes encode for the, all of the elements that make up our cells. And there's a finite set of those. And amongst this set that is actually very visible, only half of them actually have been studied in greater detail by any scientist studying Alzheimer's disease. So it suggests that there might be a lot of things out there that we don't really know. Yeah, I thought it was actually really interesting. You were talking about how kind of human nature goes around and impacts science. So um, one of the things that I found interesting was the, if a new junior researcher is coming up and they say, ah, I'm going to study Alzheimer's, but I'm going to look after this gene that nobody's looked at before. Very, very few people think that is very relevant. The consequence to their career, um, which you discovered, was that it's likely that they will not advance. They will not end up ultimately getting their own laboratory if they, discovered, if they went after a gene that was not well known. Is that because they... Um, they are, everybody already knew there was nothing to find there and that person went errantly looking after this or why do you think this is happening? I think that is certainly a suspicion that many will have that maybe it shouldn't be investigated. Uh, that also holds probably for many of the genes that have not been investigated to greater detail. But this argument all becomes very suspicious once when the, all the data suggests that it is important for something that's important for societies. And no matter kind of which disease it is, be it like different forms of lung cancer or Alzheimer's or uh, other diseases. Um, there still seems to be this thing that junior researchers progress less in their careers when they start to explore and even publish on a less investigated gene. 
Um, I suspect that it is, has to do with some social mechanisms. Um, I think I don't really know it, the right answer yet. I, I have some ideas, but I think if we would understand actually what's going on, we could actually design better science. But since all of these things still prevail, I'm actually not sure if all of the ideas that I would have actually turn out to be correct. But, um... Well, let's hypothesize for a little bit. <laughs> I mean, one of the ideas that comes to mind for me is that uh, maybe you have a professor that falls in love with their research and they end up liking people that also study the same kinds of genes. And so you end up being like, hey, I want to talk about these things. We have a really deep knowledge. So it's easier to build relationships. And my guess is, that who gets laboratories it may, it may be largely determined by your science, but also largely determined by the relationships you have with other people. Absolutely. There definitely is this uh, element. Uh, also, that's one of the hypotheses out there that basically there's no community or tribe of studying uh, a certain gene, particularly if it's like new, there's no one else out there. That's not like a conference, that's not someone who could kind of write reference letters maybe, or who could basically provide reagents, like things that take time to manufacture. So like being part of a community definitely has some advantages. And there's also this idea about science actually being a tournament um, type of economy. So basically it's best to be the first one to discover something, but even kind of being second in a tournament in also most sports is actually much better to actually be the best in a sport that no one is watching. Uh, interesting. So basically it could be this tournament type of dynamics. So what about uh, you? How do people, are you like viewed in this world as like, um, like a cop coming around here being like, hey, I've got new ideas on the way you guys ought to do your research. How has your stuff been received? Because <laughs> you're basically saying like, hey, I think you guys might be heading down the wrong paths. Um, so it has been received differently by different people. Um, I should say that some of the kindest and nicest and most supportive people that I actually have met are people that work at the National Institutes of Health. This also includes some collaborators that actually try to actively try to better science and understand science better so that interventions can be designed. Um, on the side of individual scientists, particularly younger ones, they really like it because they see all of this vast majority topics that could be explored in the future and no one is really studying them yet. So it would be a lot of opportunities and kind of fascination. Um, from one of one kind of motivating part, but also a little bit heartbreaking is when sometimes uh, family of someone who has like a severe disease kind of was calling in the office, kind of asking for advice, like feeling that like the disease is not studied enough so that's kind of, I think that's kind of one of the small government realizes that it's more than just like academic ivory tower. Um, from the, from some scientists, they're also kind of very skeptic though. Uh, basically they could see it as something that could divert resources or could even kind of damage the reputation of science itself. Um, so I think that's also a very valid concern. Uh, the people lose some trust in science and basically putting some information out there where science could work even better or more efficiently uh, can also sadly be understood in a way where people that care about science feel that someone is attacking science, which is not my intent. Yeah, I mean, I think that like to describe your work in terms of the value it creates for other people, um, I was looking at um, some stuff on COVID and how you had suggested like, look, you know, of the number of avenues that we could go towards, the things that we could look at to say, how can we treat this and what are the cause causal mechanisms that are happening here? Um, we're really just in a very narrow uh, frame set and we really should widen it out. If you are going to steel man the other side of this and say, ah, no, I, we shouldn't be widening it out because that's going to dilute us. Um, what, how would you say that the, the people that think that you're harming things, wh where do they have a good argument? Um, they have a good argument uh, for um, kind of trying to be first in something. So if science is a, a tournament, or maybe it's about something that you maybe you want to patent, or something that maybe you can show certain leadership, 
maybe actually for something, it is important to put resources into try to be the first on everything. Uh, so I think there will be at one point like a trade-off, which is not easy, just like what's the right balance of kind of pursuing some things as quickly as possible versus kind of diversifying. Uh, but basically it's a good argument to be made to be fast with investigating something. You know, I was uh, like, as I was reading this, I was kind of thinking about the Pareto distribution, right? How, and this, for anybody that doesn't know, this is that 80-20 rule, right? Where um, 80% of your business comes from 20% of your clients or, you know, 20% of a given population will be the, the ones that get most um, of the resources and then everybody else has to divide the remaining part. Is there a chance that the reason that the work uh, gets focused on just a small number of genes is because it's a Pareto distribution and these genes work because 20% of the genes are doing 80% of the work? Yes. Uh, so it is a Pareto distribution. It's even like more like depending on which set of gene one takes, it could even be like that the 20% almost account for 90% of their work. Uh, so it is a Pareto distribution. A Pareto distribution could come from multiple different things. It means that there's some kind of disproportional effort going to some. This could be that once it is populated, it attracts even more things. So stepping back, the question is, should we biologically expect that? And so genes encode for proteins. And um, this has recently been a nice study where they investigated how proteins bind each other, which proteins bind each other. And in the literature, it would look like more similar, like a Pareto distribution, which would basically indicate that some genes are encode for proteins that connect to many more proteins and there's a disproportional binding. And as you said, Laszlo Vasi is a guest of it was kind of along these directions. But then there's now been some people that actually tried all pairwise combinations of which protein can bind which protein. And they found that when one now is able to do these exhaustive experiments, uh, these underlying distributions actually look different. So which indicates that the, for the biomedical research, this Pareto distribution doesn't come from the inherent biological importance, but more from the way we scientists approach biology and still have to, a lot to learn. <laughs> So, you know, if you're a scientist and you're studying the genes that impact something like Alzheimer's, your great, you know, quest, your, your like thing that you're trying to get to is to discover whatever the genes are that will unlock people from Alzheimer's. But in your world where you're kind of in this meta level of research, where you're trying to discover the holes that are kind of in a, a bunch of different areas, what is your you know, highest peak? What's, what's the great goal that you continue to pursue? Um, basically to enable others to do more research like that. So basically, uh, while I try to understand science and the state of scientific approaches to that, I also once actually asked how many different genes have the most successful and productive researchers worked on during the uh, career. And I'm not the best biology that is of our times, but like basically the very best biologists will maybe like study like 10 genes. But we know since like roughly 20 years that we have at least 20,000 genes that are considered very interesting. So basically there's no way that any single laboratory or even no, any single institute can actually approach that problem. It's orders of magnitude bigger than any scientist could do. So I think my ultimate goal is actually to enable others to actually kind of follow the passion of discovery and see what's hiding behind all of these things that seem to be very important, but no one else in the world is investigating them to greater detail. Yeah, I was reading, I'm not sure if it was in the New York Times or The Economist, where um, basically they were looking back on the Human Genome Project. And I remember when, when the human genome was first mapped and basically people were like, we did it, we got the map. And now all we got to do is like, you know, take our ship around to this continent and that one, and we're going to, you know, explore everything. But now all these many years after that's happened, we really have only mapped maybe 15% of all of the, the interesting genes, meaning that the 85% that remains has decades and decades worth of research to, to be going after. And that your research kind of concluded that 
we aren't even going after them. Like the speed with which we're going towards new land is is um, very slow relative to continuing to to pour down the path of the same ones we've known before. Absolutely. Um, it's, and one could even add to that, that we biologists, and particularly biologists that work around genes, are in an extraordinarily lucky position. In most scientific disciplines, we do not know what we do not know. But we biologists, we kind of know what we do not know. We know that there should be roughly 20,000 things that could be quite interesting, maybe 10,000 extremely interesting. And we are kind of only focusing on a couple of thousands. So we know what we don't know. Uh, so I'm not sure if it's actually special to the Human Genome Project, but the Human Genome Project really enabled us actually to see our ignorance and also enabled us to biologists to create tools that would allow to study some of these other things. So for instance, there, because of the Human Genome Project, it's quite possible to measure gene, all the genes in a single experiment, like how do they change in an experiment? So we, or we know which genes contribute to individual diseases or con contribute to susceptibilities to severe pneumonia after COVID-19. So we kind of have these basic measurements. Uh, what's kind of missing is now the jump from having these basic measurements to more detailed experiments and characterizations. So it's, it's funny because if you think about somebody that's an astronomer, for example, right, they're looking out into the universe and they think, ah, you know, we, we know that there's black holes and planets and stars and galaxies, but there's a high likelihood that there's just stuff out there we've never heard of, we don't have a name for, we don't even know what we're looking for. But within just the genes, if you're just talking about human genetics, we can say, well, we at least know how many genes there are. And if we discover things that result or the complications that come from how those interact with one another as a network, but at least there's some finite amount of things that we can explore. So you could presumably get to the end, whereas exploring the universe feels infinite and you'll never get to the end. Absolutely. And I think there's even like evidence that also astronomy, for instance, is biased. So for instance, the planets that have been discovered outside of the solar system, we know that these are unusually big planets. So like from understanding of physics and astronomy, so basically the things that we can see, some things are less difficult to spot, namely the big planets. And I think that could also be happening for other types of sciences. And looking back at biology, that something similar actually has also happened. So uh, how does one, like in your world, I would imagine it requires a great deal of creativity because there's not really a map. You're just saying, hey, let's look at all of the work that's being done and see if we can discover gaps by creating computer programs. So how is it that you've constructed these um, experiments in your, in your mind and then gone about mm -hmm. creating them? So basically, yeah. I went in kind of those three stages. Uh, in the first one, I tried to think, what are all of the different things that could affect research? Uh, it's probably not, not complete, but like everything I could think of, like basically whether something similar has been studied in other contexts, what are biophysical properties of the genes and the proteins encoded by them, uh, try to be quite complete. And then it, only after I had accumulated, what is now over 100 types of different information about the sciences, including careers of all scientists, uh, I went to the modeling and tried to understand which of these things actually explain science and where are the gaps in knowledge. Um, and now in kind of the third stage that uh, I've recently begun is actually then taking some of these discrepancies or gaps in knowledge and also actually trying to go back to basic research and study some of those genes and the things they been would know about is just other contexts and see do they actually extend. Particularly for myself, I'm interested in aging. Like, can we in the third step learn something more about aging by looking at these steps? So I want to like highlight this thing because it, you're, you're, you're very soft spoken in the way that you describe this, but the level of detail that you went through when you were doing this research and you were saying, hey, let's try and find gaps, let's also look at, hey, in what labs, and you're focusing on which genes, how does that impact your career over a period of time? So being able to track just like, 
hey, what happens to an individual as they've made these decisions when they are, you know, it takes individuals to study science. So they're out there studying science. And then what happens to their career, but not just any one individual, you're looking at a mass of them. And then saying, ah, well, now we can see that there are some causation here. Like if, if you're doing, like we said earlier, you're studying unknown genes, you may not get a laboratory. How does that then create a feedback loop? This is fascinating, right? Because it seems really far away from the world of biological sciences, but without that knowledge, you would, you could, uh, it'd be very hard to redirect where people are going. And uh, just, just even having the idea to think about something like this is, is quite, um, it's, it's just, it's fascinating to me that you would even come up with that. So basically this argument that people have been studying the same things as in the past, has already been made 20 years ago by biologists. So biologists have repeated that again and again. So I suspect that, that the reason why things haven't really changed is not so much about biologists not being aware of the potential problem, but that some of the things that we think to understand about that phenomenon might be wrong, or that basically something else, which is, is needed, and this something else given all of the large experimental advances that have been made in the last year, things just for instance about CRISPR, if those experimental approaches are not sufficient, it might be something less about the science or the methods, but something more on the social side that actually is holding us back. So in that regard, how do you feel about um, groups like the NIH and how they have so much influence over what gets studied because they create grants? What has your research taught you about or shown you about how groups like that impact the nature of science and where we're at today? Yeah. So I think for, for the NIH, um, I think that people that think on a very long term time scale and very intelligent. Um, I think also looking at some data, actually see that when the NIH started programs to promote research into underexplored genes, that these things actually generally work. So there are programs that the NIH can design that seem to be working. Uh, but one obstacle I think that many people also uh, policymakers face is actually that scientists hold them back. So basically, the for instance, when you think about the research grant, there's like one aspect where me as a researcher has to write a grant and submit it, for instance, to the NIH. And, but they then give it to other researchers that then basically review their work, basically, and give kind of an, a score of how well they think this research will work out and how valuable it is. And I think there are many indications that it's actually this kind of peer review and basically other scientists that then discourage the NIH and other policymakers from exploring the unknown further, because there's like more risk, there's more uncertainty. And if basically they have to compare like an extremely fantastic project where it's quite sure that it will actually work and will probably benefit like uh, the scientists involved and maybe also in their trainees. And then there's like some other project which has more uncertainty. Uh, it's understandable that many people maybe favor the first one over the second one. And I think that is a problem for policymakers. Um, to yeah, I mean, I think I see that in, in all domains, right? In business and everything. You bring in the new people that say, hey, I want to try this totally out there idea, which is the thing that will bring you new discoveries. It will knock, in, knock you into new frontiers. But when you're looking at it and you're an experienced person, you can look at it and say, ah, you know, we've already tried that or we looked around there and it didn't work. And these things you can you can waste a lot of money. And some of that wisdom is correct, but also some of that wisdom can have the impact of uh, stultifying things that maybe just barely missed last time. And this time, if you if you never swing back to it, you'll never get there. Yes. Uh, that is very true. I think that could be quite happening. So like then, like to your earlier question, I think maybe one thing that, for instance, policymakers could make and have partially been making is like to set aside a certain amount of money for these kind of projects, which are a little bit outside of the main lines of scientific research that would be less, difficult, less easy to predict that might be more rewarding on the long run. 
So one of the questions I like to ask scientists that are deep into the game, but I think it can make people a little uncomfortable, is uh, what do you think of the current peer review process? Do you Would you keep it in whole? Would you make dramatic changes to it? I think it depends on the context. Uh, basically, there's a peer review uh, system in place for individual research publications that acts as a channels. I think this is overall a good thing, also because I think there's actually maybe even like too much science being published. Uh, so there's like some arguments that can be said that if there's too many publications, it will actually slow uh, down science basically making it more difficult for new ideas to surface. So I think actually kind of having a, some kind of a limitation on the production of research publications could actually help new ideas. Uh, for the kind Wait, of that's novel. I have never heard anybody say that before, uh, that, um, that, that one of the consequences of this drive to publish is that now there's more and more publications. And as there's more publications out there, then the people that are reading this research and saying, ah, I want to know, I want to be up to date on what's going on. The flood of information is actually keeping them from reading enough or knowing what the state of the art is. And so therefore publishing more doesn't get you anywhere faster. It means you have to sort through more noise potentially. Absolutely. So I think one term of this is cognitive overload. And basically some sociologists of the University of Chicago have basically shown uh, that in research fields that grow bigger and bigger and bigger and there are more and more research publications published, um, that the researchers then kind of refer to old ideas and they tend to less and less include new ideas. Uh, so there seems, at least in the comparison of different scientific fields and as they grow, that if they grow, to a certain size, the turnover of ideas actually becomes slower. And biology is a really big field, which might actually contribute to some of the things that we're facing. Yeah, and the pressure that individuals feel, like if you want to get your, um, you know, you want to get into a prestigious university or you want to um, get tenure, you have to publish. And then you're in competition with everybody else that's in that that level. But I had, I had always thought of it as being... Um, something that uh, led people to making, um, having a high time preference, right? They want to get it out the door quickly as opposed to doing long, slow, complicated things that maybe you don't get to publish as often. But I'd never thought about the information overload that comes. I mean, and that one seems intuitively obvious. If I have a bookshelf of 20 books or I have a, a room of a thousand books, I'm far more likely to read 20 books on the one that's the bookshelf of just 20 books. Yeah. And basically, also with the bookshelf, maybe if maybe it's, if it was easier to get like certain let's say crime novels, then maybe like uh, some uh, books about art, maybe you would be reading more crime novels. And basically, there is this additional thing that all lead kind of scientists to certain types of research, while new ideas are a little bit more difficult to present. So uh, now that we're talking about bookshelves, um, what books do you like reading? Somebody that's uh, pushing the envelopes of science, trying to find gaps, what do you read to, to be creative? Uh, thanks for the kind words. So basically I try to uh, read uh, relatively short things with many different ideas. Um, I really love the work of Ray uh, Amantrud, uh, which is uh, a lot of nice poetry. Um, the re most one of the most recent books that I've read was actually one that's half science, half art, where they tried like to reconstruct how uh, dinosaurs are drawn, basically because the that we just have fossils and there's like a lot of uncertainty in the reconstruction of how dinosaurs really kind of looked like, like all of the soft tissue, for instance, is kind of gone. Uh, so basically, there are some approaches of how we kind of reconstruct how dinosaurs probably have looked like, which is by itself interesting. But then basically the funny part is when they apply the same approaches to current day animals. And the animals look very different. Like, for instance, like a rabbit, would, people wouldn't know that they have long ears and these things. And the head was different. So basically, kind of, you see kind of how even like despite following very good practices, 
things look very different. And it's like something where you have to have this mixture, a little bit of science and like some visualization. So very travel. <laughs> I've, I've always thought like um, the ability to draw things that are not like um, if somebody ever had me describe a person to one of those portrait officers at, you know, in a crime show where they're like, how, how did he look? And then the one person is listening to you make those descriptions and then they turn it around. I couldn't describe my own mother or my own wife to somebody in such a way that they could draw it. So this idea of drawing um, dinosaurs from just this like small amount of data that's, you know, hundreds hundreds of thousands, millions of years old, seems like, uh, yeah, it's it's funny. I would not have thought about how wrong we could probably be, but we might never know. Yeah, I mean, and many things are right. And it, but like, there is this gap of information one has to make plausible assumptions. And it's very valid assumptions that people usually draw and they're doing it well, but still there's like some uncertainty and there is, we're seeing the results we actually might not be aware of what is actually a reasonable assumption, what is really backed up. And like, if one is not in the field of doing dinosaur research, one wouldn't really be able to discern things at the first moment. <laughs> You know, just uh, so St. Louis has this place called the World Bird Sanctuary, and it's not very big, but it's about um, maybe a third of a mile long where uh, you just walk down this path on the top of a ridge and there's birds on all sides and you can get within like two to three feet of a, of a bald eagle or oh. of hawks or of an emu, which I had never been close to an <laughs> emu before, but that thing looks so much like what I imagine a dinosaur to look like. It's like utterly terrifying when you look down at its claws and there's like these sharp talons. It's, um, if you've never seen an emu up close, I highly recommend it. Oh, now I have second thoughts about it, but yeah. So what books did you read as a young person? What science fiction uh, captured your mind back then? Oh, I was very um, bad at reading books. Basically, my attention span leveled off after like 50 to 100 pages usually. So I barely actually finished any book. Um, so I kind of then started more, I think with kind of some graphic novels and poetry and realized actually that this has like a faster turnover of ideas and um, some things about a little bit about design, but basically realizing that there's much to learn from books that is actually difficult to foresee. Like, like for instance, one of my favorite books is actually like when it's a book that collects all of the stories. So I think there are around 1,500 stories uh, that people basically have told in different cultures uh, over the centuries. And there's some people that try like to collect all of these stories and kind of prepare the core of the stories. Uh, so that's something I kind of really, uh, that, that was one of the first ones I really enjoyed. <laughs> So that's kind of like the archetype of stories, right? Like the, let's figure out all the different relationships that two people could have romantically or uh, politically and trying to isolate them out into, into like about the number of, of permutations there could be. Uh, essentially, basically, um, so basically um, taking like things starting from fairy tales uh, uh, or folklore, basically like all of these stories that follow certain patterns and trying to list all of the permutations that have been encountered in the world, so to say. <laughs> How does a person that is as deep into science as you are now, it's, it's fascinating. I think most people would not be willing to admit what you just said, but I think it's totally a natural thing, right? Like I, I just wasn't that into books. I'd get to a hundred and I'd be <laughs> done with it. I know a lot of people that are like that, but you're in the deep sciences where you have to read a great deal. How did you overcome that then to be able to get deep enough in to produce good work? Um, so one trick is like trying to rotate multiple things at the same time. Um, and also kind of reserving some time maybe over the weekend or so for reading a little bit longer on some things. Um, but that kind of helped me. Plus I kind of got a little bit faster with reading. Uh, basically kind of seeing what are the parts that um, are easy you know, to follow than others and basically reading those a little bit faster than the airway would have to pay attention. Um, 
And uh, what do you do with your free time then? What, how do you explore? What do you, what do you spend time doing now that you're at Northwestern University? <laughs> so at Northwestern, I was quite active within our postdoc association, trying to create like more opportunities for fellow postdocs. Uh, outside of Northwestern, one thing that I really love doing is uh, running. So like last year, I also joined a running club and trying to get a relatively high mileage and uh, running close to the lake. Uh, I love bouldering, uh, meeting with friends, um, also organizing actually in Chicago some volunteering activities. That's another hobby at the main current time. Well, Thomas, what do you think is the future of science? Where do you think things are going? Will we have big breakthroughs in our lifetime or are we going to go through a long uh, drought? Are, are breakthroughs happening right now and we just don't know it? I hope that there is a breakthrough that it is happening right now. But if we look at the past and history of science, people are always, no matter at which time, had the feeling that their times are really special. And there was just a break just around the corner and the newest discoveries are exceptional. And probably there's some truth in it because people have always been doing great discoveries. But I don't think that our times is more unusual than other ones. Um, maybe one thing that we can do is really kind of taking this gift of this human genome project and knowing which things we know and which ones we don't know. I personally hope that we can design some more clever ways of science and knowing that there's so many gaps in knowledge in things that are important to us and our health and society, effects of uh, biomedical research, maybe we can kind of re-navigate re and kind of see what's missing there. But otherwise, I think things will continue more or less the way they are now. They will yield some interesting things, but I think things could be faster. If you were uh, advising a young person that's excited and interested in biology, what field would you tell them they should go explore? So um, currently, three fields of biomedical research seem more open towards novelty and innovation. So basically, I, again, kind of looked at all of the publications through uh, computational approaches, last best, like more novelty appearing. And the three fields where many things are currently happening is the biology of aging, then things relating to human vision. And I think it's not a coincidence, uh, nutrition. <laughs> Yeah, we just had Laszlo Barabasi <laughs> yes. on and the nutrition conversation <laughs> was mind blowing, right? His belief that uh, we've been really honed down on just the macronutrients, proteins, carbs, and fats, and a few, a few of the nutritional components, but that there's this massive amount of molecules that we've been eating. And we have no idea how it impacts us, how it regulates our bloodstream, how it does that, that conversation alone really opened up my eyes to how easy it is to oversimplify a subject and then have that become what is just known because everyone you talk to, dietitians, people that have spent their entire lives on this, the, the, the subjects um, Barabasi was bringing up was, would, they, they never talk about it at all. And I've been to their conferences. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's maybe again indicating how much scientists used to study only some element of our scientific problem or question. And that even like in things that are even close to us and we can experience on an everyday basis, like many of the other things, there's still so much more to learn, discover and understand. Yeah, and it's kind of like uh, Michael Levin always talks about whenever I've had him on, he's always saying, you know, you really have to be careful how you define things and what you think you know. Because, um, you know, I, I've been at places where people are like, we already know the way you get fat is it's, you know, calories in, calories out, proteins, carbs, and fats. And for a long time, if you don't have another framework with which to explore that, then you just accept that wisdom as true. And you don't even, it doesn't even become something that you could question because it's the thing that's always been there. Yes, and to some extent, we also rely on the information that we get and that we have access to. Um, the many, and one, one can't think about all of the different topics of the world at the same time. So at some extent, there seems like some kind of trust that we have to in the things that we are hearing. <laughs> yeah, and there's a weird challenge, and I find this on the podcast, right? Like, um, if I want to explore ideas that are outside, that are like what I call up the graph, 
I will inevitably interview people that uh, other people say, oh, that person's a crazy person, right? You know, that person is saying things that are that are so wrong that you're doing something bad by giving them a platform to those ideas. And it, th that's really obvious when you're talking about things like, uh, you know, somebody that denies the Holocaust, right? Like, th th okay, th that may be an idea you don't want to explore, but you also need to be really very, very careful that uh, you don't get guided to say, oh, no, those people, their ideas shouldn't be discussed at all. I, I, um, I used to work at Monsanto and people that were non-GMO that thought, hey, GMOs are all bad. It becomes very easy to get into your club and say anybody that doesn't like GMOs is just entirely wrong. Everything that they're saying is incorrect and we should throw it out. But it's, it's very difficult to break away from your tribe and try to be open to ideas that your tribe says shouldn't be allowed in. Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, I think one thing that you're also doing here is just kind of this idea of like, almost inquisition or kind of asking why and like asking for the reasons. I think that is something actually that we also helps like to see if people have thought about it, what are the reasons they come to a certain belief. With uh, the example that you mentioned with people basically having very strong beliefs. There was this thing that people kind of can adopt different identities. And there's this idea, I think, Amantia said that basically, if they see one identity under some threat or something that's out of their control, maybe, they become very, very protective of one thing. Yeah, and it's it's like um, you feel righteous when you're defending a group, right? So if you're saying, um, and I, uh, this was something that happened to me all the time when I was doing my work with Monsanto, is that if you threaten somebody's identity, they don't necessarily come back like with the, you're threatening me. They come forward with the idea of like, I'm here to protect my group. And because I'm protecting the group, I am righteous and my like emotional level that I bring to this is, is perfectly acceptable because everyone I talk to, when I turn around and say, Hey, did you see what I did for you group? All those people around you are supporting you getting that emotional about that. And I'm certain this is happening in the, in the field that you're talking about with science, getting too slimmed down into one area. Maybe it's not the emotional vitriol of the anti GMO, but it's still that same kind of team mentality. Absolutely. And I think people have also observed something similarly. I think when they were studying, for instance, I think the early day of I think Calvinism is an example of maybe also extreme views. There also a lot of the arguments were actually made that people even like that they, they have to do things for the others. And um, even if things maybe would feel maybe not completely right, uh, and maybe actually some people would do things that they wouldn't personally want to do, they would argue that it is a, for the group. And they basically have to help the others. So that, that it's a little bit tricky because they think there's this delicate balance of seeing what might be good for others and trying to care about that. But actually that also can lock things in a sometimes not so fortunate way. Yeah, I mean, I think that uh, this is something well understood, right? When you're trying to um, get... Uh, young men to go off and fight in war, one of the ways that you can do it is to create to that generate that level of loyalty that comes through enduring pain and sacrifice and suffering together. So one of the functions of boot camp is to make it so I've gone through some trying, you know, really intense experience. And so now I'm going to be far more trusting of the guys that were to the left and right of me. And then when we are all going to do something like shoot at other people, because I'm doing it for them and not just for my own good, I'm much, much more likely to do this. And this occurs across all sorts of, of domains. Like uh, I one time remember reading a story about a, a social scientist that knew if you do something that's really exciting with somebody else, that the dopamine that, that, get, that gets um, happened makes people more likely to fall romantically in love. And so he got a rickshaw in Thailand with this girl that he'd been trying to court. And uh, they go through the streets and they're running and it's really exciting. There's traffic everywhere. And he can tell she's just getting really, really excited and happy. And they get done. And he's like, what did you think? And she was like, oh my gosh, that driver was amazing. Oh. <laughs> 
but it's true, right? You go through this exciting thing. You have these good feelings and you want to be around other people. You like them. They become a part of your group. Yes. And well, yes, it, there's like some biology there that is basically reinforcing this thing. So probably it's like, if it's, if it's dead, it must be there for some reason in a way <laughs> that worked the past in some sense. So um, as you look around at the world and um, you're like saying, hey, when I'm not doing research, when I'm not focusing on this stuff, what do you pay attention to and how much time do you take away from your work? I mean, I know you have your hobbies like running and you're organizing. Mm. Do you watch the news? Um, I tend to read the news mostly, like in the morning, uh, generally New York Times, a few international newspapers. Uh, I think the international perspective is quite interesting to see how things are covered in different regions. Um, basically, it's mostly reading the news in the morning. It's a kind of morning routine. <laughs> yeah, I haven't really thought about that, but I would, I almost only read the news. Yeah, I, like uh, there's almost nothing on television or YouTube the way that I would get news that way, almost almost never. And, and now that I think about it, it's probably because it's so much more emotional. I don't like the emotionality of it. Yes, that is, I can understand that. I think, uh, I think for me it's also a little bit about kind of the time. So I think sometimes the, uh, actually I'm not sure. It could just be like a habit that I picked up once <laughs> and enjoy. <laughs> so Thomas, if people wanted to learn more about your lab or find out about your research, where would you recommend they go? Googling for Thomas Stöger in Western and they will find me. Well, Thomas Stoger, this was very interesting. I'm excited to see what doors you open into science. Thank you so much for coming on. Ah, ah, ah.